Hebrews 1 says that in the first century, 20 centuries ago, we were in the last days. You know, people, especially non-evangelicals, laugh at us and say, oh, we're all escapists, you know, we're trying to get out of here, and we're always talking about the end times. We're in the last days. Jesus said so, so they're off base when they don't think so. But if, if we're in the last days, then we are, we are at the end of days of the last days. I mean, you know what I mean? It's so amazing to think where we live. For example, uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 gives us a newscopter view of the world for the second coming. You know, you ever watch like Fox News or anything and they have the helicopter chasing the car, you know, and you can watch it from above. And, and it's a total different view of news than I remember when I was a little kid. You know, it was more the cameraman was on the ground and you were looking at a little snatch. But nowadays, when you look at even tsunamis, you see it from the air and you don't just see the event, you see like the Japanese thing we all watched on TV, the big tsunami. You saw it coming from a distance. Matthew 24 is the second coming of Christ from a distance, and Jesus dictates it. And, and if you study Matthew 24 or Luke 21 or Mark 13, you find out that every single trend that was present on the earth at the second coming of Christ is now present. It's, it wasn't present in Ben Franklin's era. It wasn't present in Paul's era. It wasn't present in the Reformer's era. It wasn't even present when Arno C. Gabeline wrote all those great prophetic books at the turn of the century and beyond. But since about 1967 to about 1979, every single one of the, of the details that Christ gave is present in our world. So that marks we're in the final part of the end of days so why i say all that i'm not going to preach on prophecy i'm going to preach on why did jesus write the book of revelation and and look in chapter one because this is christ's last words to his church in the book of revelation and jesus said i want you to know rather than spend your life combing the news looking for another clue about you know something you can say prophetically is happening i want you to know my perspective on what I want you to be doing at the end of days. That's what the book of Revelation is written about. At creation, God the Son, the Creator, spoke and made all things. And now as we open to the last book of the Bible, all the other parts of the Bible were breathed out through apostles and prophets. And all of them are inspired, all 66 books. But this one is different than all the rest. Because this book contains not a message that flows through one of Christ's writing apostles. If you think about it, inspiration says God, the word is theopneustos, and God breathes out his pure, holy, infallible, and inerrant word, but he breathes it out through an individual. It, when he breathed out through Luke, it took on Luke's incredible, sublime understanding of the Greek language, and it's, it's as beautiful as any Greek literature that's extra biblical. When he, when he wrote through Peter, he got the fishermen make up words that are nowhere else in the Bible. Peter, I mean, Peter has more what we call hapox legomenoi, one-time occurring words in the Bible, and they're very hard to understand words. Or he breathed out through the apostle Paul. And Paul was such an amazing mind that Paul formed words, like he formed a whole family of words about Christians that, that are like sum athlete, sum mimite, sum ergoi. These are all words he puts a Greek preposition on, say we are supposed to work together, labor together, struggle together. But all those took on the, the flavor. It's like stained glass windows. The pure light comes through the window, but it picks up the color of the glass. Revelation 1, 2, and 3 doesn't pick up any color. These are direct words from Christ. They are breathed out the only letters Jesus personally wrote. And there's seven of them in chapter 2 and 3. And, and verses 9 onward are Jesus Christ revealed in a way he's not revealed anywhere else in the Bible. So I'm a big fan of Revelation. In fact, I spent 10 years of my life 
uh, laboring under all the, the, the faculty at Dallas Seminary to, to write my dissertation. It took me 10 years. And I wrote it on the 404 verses that are in this last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation. Well, the, the first word, look at Revelation 1.1. The first word in the Greek text is it's the revelation, the apocalypsis of Jesus. That means in this last book, listen, we're getting to see the real Jesus. And, and I want you to think about what that means. Because in the Gospels, we have no physical descriptions of what Jesus looked like. In fact, you couldn't have identified him. That's why Judas said, the one that I go up to and kiss, that's who you're supposed to arrest. Why? Why didn't you just say, the big brawny redhead, you know, the guy with rippling muscles, with, you know, blue eyes. There is no physical description of Jesus in the Gospels, the 89 chapters. The first time we see what he looks like, it's right here in chapter 1. And what's amazing is, this isn't what he looked like then. This is what he looks like forever. This is what he's going to look like. You know, we have all those beautiful songs, you know. The first thing I want to see when I get to have a member, Fanny Crosby wrote him. Uh, I want to see Jesus. Well, this is what he looks like. And this is seeing the real Jesus. This is the completion of God's revelation of himself to humanity through Christ. Do you remember how in Genesis, Adam and Eve got to enjoy something? It doesn't really say it until they fell. It's what they lost. It says that God came in the cool of the day walking through the garden to walk and talk with them. And what did they do when they heard his voice? Yeah, they ran and hid. So what that is saying is what they used to do is run to see him and they ran to, to fellowship with him. That's what Genesis says God did in the garden with Adam and Eve before they fell. He, he got to walk through life fellowshipping with them. But after the fall, God was separated and wasn't able to walk in fellowship with them. What's amazing, when we get to Revelation, God the Creator, God the Son, is again walking with us. In fact, look at Revelation 1, starting in verse 9, because I, I love this. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation. I had someone come to me this week and they said, do you think we're going through the tribulation? They said, and, and they started talking about that, and then I said, well... In the sense of verse 9, all believers have gone through the, the tribulation as far as the struggle that people who hate Christ invoke upon us and, and, and resisting against our flesh and resisting against the world and the devil. But I said, do you think that the Lord's going to confine us to this planet when he opens the pit and lets all those demon hordes out? I said, no, he's already told us he's not. But the Christian life is hard. And don't ever think, the, the, the more and more difficult it becomes to be a Christian that we're going to go through. Because I don't know if you've seen, and, and last night, Rennie's message was so powerfully pointing toward where this whole culture is going. We are going to be sticking out so clearly because of our convictions of, of the word and the Lord we serve that, that we're going to feel like we're in the tribulation, but we're not going through the biblically described tribulation. We know we have our blessed hope. But look what he says. I'm, I'm because of the, the testimony of Jesus at the end of verse 9. I am in the spirit on the Lord's day, he said, verse 10. And he hears behind him a loud voice. And, and Jesus introduces himself in verse 11. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek language, the first and the last, literally, what you see right in a book and send it now, here's the second truth that I want you to think about. The book of Revelation is the only book. Now, I want you to hear this carefully. I don't want anybody to go home or go to lunch and start saying, nah, I don't agree with that. This is the only letter written to all the churches primarily. Now, no, think for a minute. Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans. So the initial primary recipient was the church at what? But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for. And so secondarily, it's to all of us. Paul wrote about all the problems and vicissitudes and struggles and weaknesses of the churches in Corinth. He wrote them two letters. The primary recipients of the Corinthian epistles were not us. It was them. 
But we have the same problems today. And it's, it's like Paul prescribed medicine inspired by God for that local church. And all of us, when we see the same problems in our local church, the same prescription is applicable. But what was the first intended recipient of those letters? Corinth, Rome, Thessalonica, Philippi. This is the only letter primarily written to every church. This is the most meaningful because it's Jesus Christ applying everything. See, this is the end of the Bible. We've had all the writing apostles and all of the prophets are finished and now the capstone that, listen, applies everything we got in those epistles to the church. This is the finale. This is the conclusion. This is Jesus Christ saying, this is what I expect from you. So he says, verse 11, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and then he lists them. Well, amazingly, what, what the Lord says is this, and, and go back to verse 1, because I want you to see Revelation 1.1. 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must, in my Bible, New King James says, shortly take place. You know, one of the, the criticisms of the church by many, they say, shortly take place. This thing's 2,000 years old. It doesn't say shortly as in soon. That's not what tacos means. The Greek word is tacos, not taco. Not talking about lunch. Tacos, T-A-X-O-S. Do you know what that word means? It means swiftly. That's where we get the word tachometer. And, and you know, that measures the speed of things. This the events that take place in Revelation, the Lord says, when they take place, they take place tacos. Did you know that you're starting, if you're paying any attention, you're sensing the tachometer. The speed is going like this. I mean, what the Bible says the sign of the end is that events in the world began to be global events. Never in the history of our planet do we have global events. We had a world war, and you know what? That world war started in the first world war, at least, started when, you know, the Habsburg, whoever, got shot by the, you know, nut and over in old Yugoslavia. Do you remember all that stuff that went on in, in this precipitated World War I in history? Remember learning that? Do you know how long it took for the world to know we were all at war? Months. Did you know now... We have Fukushima put a steam cloud out in that reactor and one to two billion people see it on television the same day. And if you are a pocket device, you know, handheld computer that's, that's always on, you would have gotten a push notification through whatever news service you subscribe to that would have texted you that happened as it happened. Did you know that, yeah, see, someone is right with us. I gave him a candy bar to do an illustration for our service. So, uh, but do you understand what I mean? These events are happening globally. And when they, the Bible says that it's going to get to the point where the whole world is fixated on the same events. And I don't know if you've noticed how quickly public opinion shifts. I mean, all you have to do is, is have, have the news tell us something, and when you watch the news, all of a sudden you, you feel globally against, you know, those wicked, you know, standard and poor downgrading us, you know. And everyone knows about that because it's a global event. That is exactly what the Bible predicted would be the speed that things take place. Okay, let's look at the three purposes of the book of Revelation real quickly. And that is this. Look at verse 19. There are three purposes for this book, and this is why I want, I want to share this with you, and we're going to get in in the days ahead at, at looking at only uh, an overview of the seven churches because we don't have time to go into this. If, if it took me 10 years to study this, it will take me more than two sessions to cover it, but I, I'm going to give you an overview. But number one, look at verse 19. This is what the Lord says is the purpose of this book. He says, write. Now remember, Jesus is speaking. He tells John, write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after that. 
Now, the context of this, never forget the context of the book of Revelation starts way back when, when John turns in verse 12 to see the voice talking to him. Remember, John hadn't heard that voice for a long time. John was the last living apostle on Patmos, a prisoner, separated from his family. He hadn't seen his wife, hadn't seen his children, hadn't seen any other apostles because they're all hunted down and killed. His good friends all had been hunted down. He was the last apostle. He knew Peter. He had known Paul. He had known all of those early pioneers that Christ sent out. And one by one, the Roman Empire had hunted them down and martyred them. And he was the last one. Can you imagine how lonely it was? He had been the closest to Jesus Christ, and he hadn't seen him since the ascension. And now... He's going to work on that Roman penal colony of Patmos. And as he had in his heart the the, the habit, the fire of his life, he always, on the Lord's Day, began his day in a special way, in the Spirit, worshiping the Lord. It was Sunday. That's the Lord's Day. And, And he's in the Spirit. He's worshiping God before he had to go off and do whatever the Romans made him do as a prisoner. And in the midst of that, He hears a voice. Look what it says. He heard a voice, verse 11, behind me. And he just must have stood there stunned because look how long before he turns around. He hears a voice like a trumpet, verse 10 says. And verse 11, look at how long it is. I'm Alpha Omega, the the first and last, what you see right in the book. Send it to the seven churches. Verse 12, after all of that, he turns around. To look at the voice. Do you know why I think it took him so long to turn around? If I heard a trumpet behind me, I'd turn right around because I would be afraid, you know, a truck was going to run over me. He was paralyzed because, you know what his mind was saying? I know that voice. I haven't heard that voice since the top of the Mount of Olives about 70 or 60 some years ago. And he was just frozen. It's kind of like a long lost friend or someone that, that you... you, you hadn't seen for a long time and all of a sudden you recognize that voice and he just couldn't believe Jesus was talking to him and when he turns around look at when he turns around to see Jesus when I turned around verse 12 to see the voice that spoke with me having turned I saw seven golden lampstands what is that we all know that right verse 20 look at verse 20 what it says the seven lampstands the very last line are the seven churches when John sees Jesus The last time he'd seen him, he was going up into the sky, so he thought about him being in heaven. He thought about him being at the right hand of the throne of the Father, the majesty on high. But what Jesus wanted to tell him, and what he wants to tell us, is that right now what Jesus is doing is not sitting on some throne somewhere far away. Look what he's doing. He's walking in the midst of the seven, verse 13, in the middle of, of the seven lampstands was Jesus. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Seven is a number of completion. There's seven days in the week, seven colors in the spectrum. There are seven notes in the scale. Seven is a full set. There are more than seven churches. Far more than seven churches. Paul wrote to seven different churches. These are not the same seven. Some of them are the same. So what these seven represent are all churches. And what Jesus is telling John is, don't think of me up somewhere on some throne far from you. Think of me as I am right here walking around this very moment with you in my church. I am just like I was in the garden with Adam and Eve. I am walked and talked and went through life with them and that's how I'm going through life with you. Why did he say this? Because he wanted us to know how we're supposed to go through life when you're living at the very end of the end of days. And we are. We're living in a time where the Bible says there's going to be a confederation led by Persia. What is in the news? I have an aggregator, a, a news search service, that any time Iran and Israel and annihilate or destroy or wipe out or whatever, I have a whole segment of words. Whenever in the same news article, Iran and Israel, with some words about destruction, are together, it pops up in my, sur- my little news aggregator. I get two to ten articles a day 
that are in global news that are picking up what the Iranian uh, Israel hater, you know, the, the current reigning leader of their military, says about Israel. We're living in a time when just what the Bible said was going to happen, it says Iran is going to want to come in and destroy Israel. Two to ten times a day in the news, that is said somewhere in the world. And Jesus said, instead of fixating and getting fearful and thinking, oh, what am I going to go through? Am I going to go through? Am I going to be, you know, through the tribulation? Are the demons going to get me? Am I going to be beheaded? Instead of fixating on all the that, Jesus said, this is what I want you fixated on. I am in the midst, verse 13 of chapter 1, of the seven lampstands. Why? Well, number one, the, look at verse 19. Jesus said, I want you to, to write down the things which you have seen. That's John's sight of the risen Christ gathering with his local church. The most important thing, when you go back to your church this weekend, you should think about what it says in verses 9 through 20. Because Jesus Christ himself is going to be walking around your church, and he's going to be at, at Calvary Bible Church where I pastor, and he's going to be at every local church that loves him, that believes the truth about him, that proclaims the truth about him, he attends that church. You know, I remember uh, uh, one of my heroes starting out in ministry was W.A. Criswell. If you ever heard of Criswell from First Baptist in Dallas. And I used to love his expositions. And, you know, he followed in the pattern of G. Campbell Morgan. And of course, uh, John MacArthur took that pattern. And, and others nowadays are many verse-by-verse -verse expositors. But I remember W.A. Criswell... Uh, used to be such a, a man of the word that Billy Graham put his membership in that church because he wanted to identify with his love for the word of God and he traveled all around and so Billy Graham was a member of First Baptist of Dallas even though he, I don't know if he really ever attended there. And so people used to say, I remember, they used to say, I go, because I, you know, I went to Dallas Seminary, they say, I go to Billy Graham's church, First Baptist Dallas. And they thought that was really a, big thing. Do you know what I tell people? Do you know who attends Calvary Bible Church of Kalamazoo? Do you know who attends every week Calvary Bible Church of Kalamazoo? And people go, no, who? I say, Jesus Christ. And he also attends Berean Baptist. And he also attends Oakwood Bible. And he also attends, and I could go through all the other Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, gospel-proclaiming churches. And he goes to yours too. Did you know that's what we're supposed to get out of Revelation, not what is the third toe of the second foot? Did you know we spend so much time thinking about something that does not alter the way we live? It also probably brings a little anxiety. Do you know what we're supposed to focus on? Jesus Christ. And not just Jesus Christ. That is the things that are. Jesus is right now on the ground. He's the owner of the team. He calls his team the church. Jesus is right now walking through life with us, his church. He seeks to see us accomplish his will. He wants us to know what his plan is for our life every day. Uh, there's, there's something interesting about the way the Bible says life goes. In Psalm 92, it says that the greatest days of our lives are not when we're 20 years old and have the world by the tail, 30 years old at the peak of our physical strength, 50 years old at the peak of our earning. Do you know what God says the greatest days of our life are? The last days of our life. Because the weaker our physical bodies get, the more our senses diminish, the, the less we can hear, the less we can see, the less strength we have. When we're weak... What does he promise he is? Ah, so you know what the greatest days of our lives are? The weaker physical days. When we have limited mobility, limited accessibility to pleasures, limited finances, limited everything. That's when Christ is the most. Psalm 92 says that those are the greatest days of our life. We can all be like Simeon and Anna. Remember Anna? She couldn't sleep and couldn't eat. She was, she just, nothing tasted good to her. It says she did nothing but fast and pray because she couldn't sleep and wasn't hungry. It sounds like a typical elderly person, you know? But what did she do? Did she lament it? 
and say, man, I'm confined to the 40 acres of the temple platform. I, I just have such a little life. I don't get out like I used to. She spent her time in fasting and prayer. Fasting is denying self, praying is seeking God. She denied herself and sought God. So there's two ways you can look at life. You can look at life, Jesus said, the way things that you have seen are, that Jesus is right now watching every move we make with his eyes that see everything. He never leaves our side. He's always available to each of us at every moment. Do you realize that's what happened at the resurrection? I guess that's what John needed to be reminded of. John was so used to Jesus walking with him for three and a half years through life, and all of a sudden Jesus was taken away at the cross, and all of a sudden Jesus showed up again on resurrection morning, but then he went to heaven. And John needed to be reminded that the resurrection freed Christ to no longer be localized. Jesus was localized. If you were in Galilee, when he was in Galilee, you could find him. If you were in Jerusalem, when he was in Jerusalem, you could find him. But if you were in Jerusalem, when he was in Galilee, you couldn't find him. But after the resurrection, Jesus could be everywhere, all the time, with everyone, equally, completely present. That's the first thing John saw. The things which you've seen, the sight of the risen Christ. The second thing he says is, that's in chapter 1. In chapter 2 and 3, verse 19 says, write down the things that are. And what chapter 2 and 3 is, is Christ's warnings of the challenges that would face the local churches. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Jesus, when John sees him in chapter 1, verses 9 through 20, when he sees Jesus, he sees him with these blazing eyes His eyes are like fire, it says. His feet are like brass. And and he is coming. And and actually, it kind of scared John. In fact, he fainted. Remember, he fell at his feet as dead. He could see Jesus. Personally, this is my own personal opinion. I think John had seen Jesus look this way two other times. He saw him look this way when Jesus cleansed the temple the first time in John chapter 2. He saw him look that way when he cleansed the temple the second time in in Matthew chapter 21. Do you remember the two times Jesus cleansed the temple? He was angry. And he made that he made that little whip of cords and he drove fear would that have had to put into those money changers' hearts. They saw a one-man army coming. The righteous indignation and wrath of Jesus Christ. His eyes were blazing because they had turned his father's house into a den of thieves. John had witnessed that. The disciples were stunned when Jesus did that. They were really doubly stunned the second time he did it. He cleanses the temple at the beginning and the end of his ministry. John sees him looking the same way. Those fiery eyes. Only Jesus is not coming from the Jewish temple. He's coming from a personal tour of the local churches that bear his name. And you know what chapter 2 and chapter 3 are? It's what Jesus says is going to characterize the churches throughout all of the centuries until Christ comes to take his church out of the world. What characterizes the people within every local church? Did you know we have Ephesian Christians in every local church? We've got some people that are just cooling off from their first love. We have some Smyrnian Christians in every local church. They're the ones that are suffering for Christ. We have some Pergamite Christians, and that is increasing all the time. And they are so worldly that Barna can't find a statistical difference in the 21st century between Christians and unsaved people. They watch the same movies. They go to the same place on vacation. They are, have the same rate of divorce. Did you know Barna and Gallup? have both found that there is, in 21st century America, no statistical difference between the habits and lifestyles of saved and unsaved people. People that claim to be born again and people that say they are not born again. Yet, they have exactly the same incidence of divorce, the same incidence of going to Vegas to gamble, the same incidence of watching R-rated movies, the same incidence of everything. And Jesus said, those are the Pergamites. They're so wed to the world, you can't tell they're wed to Christ. And then there are Thyatira and there are Sardis Christians. There are, there are these Philadelphian, kind of the soul winner types in every church. And there are the Laodiceans, those that are rich and increased in goods. 
and they think all the church wants is their money and they're suspicious of everything and all they're concerned about is they have a lust for security and a lust for comfort and a lust for convenience and if the parking spaces aren't close enough to the church, they don't go. And if, if there is not enough security, if they don't feel safe, they don't go. They wouldn't go on one of those missions trips because they, you know, someone might take their special watch, you know, or whatever. And there's just this lust for security and convenience and comfort that's Laodicean. Jesus saw the things that are. Jesus is the owner of the church. And Jesus warns us of the pitfalls, the dangers, and the difficulties we will face. And as our coach, see, Jesus is the team owner, but he's not the team owner that stays up in the, the penthouse watching the game. He's the game owner that's on the field with the team. That's what chapter 2 and 3 are about. Jesus is not an absent owner. He's actually coaching the team. You know, we elect our own little leaders, Right? We have our chairman of the elders, our chairman of the deacons, we have our treasurer, we have our trustees, we have all that. But that's the team electing people to kind of watch over the team. Do you know what often the team forgets? The owner is there. The real coach is there. And, and sometimes we don't even acknowledge his presence in our services. We especially do that when we think it's all about us. Yeah, I remember when I was a new pastor, at least in Tulsa, I was a new pastor, and uh, it was many years ago, and, and I was standing at a bagel shop, and I didn't know a soul in Tulsa, and the bagel shop was next to the church that I was pastoring, so I was standing there in line, and, and these two men, I could tell they were pastors, and you know, I was just wanting to meet other pastors in the town, and so uh, I, I said, excuse me. I said, I heard you guys talking, sorry I was overhearing, but I said, I just moved here, and I'm, I'm the pastor right here on this street, on 61st Street. And I said, uh, what churches do you pastor? And they looked at me and they said, you're the pastor of Tulsa Bible Church? They said, they said, do you know what we've been hearing about what's going on at your church? And what they'd heard is that Tulsa Bible Church wanted to add on, and, and it was in the generation when everybody used to get bonds and have the big capital campaign, and the church went in debt. And I said, oh, I don't believe in that. I said, why don't we just have six weeks of praying, and I'll preach on God's ownership of our lives, and we'll take an offering. And so we did that. I preached for six weeks on stewardship and, and, and dedications, you know, that everything we have belongs to the Lord. And we took up an offering, we got $800,000. All of them were talking about that because, I mean, they all were in debt many times that, you know. And, and they, said, they said, we've heard everything you're doing at Tulsa Bible Church. And I looked around and I said, I said, anything good you're hearing, the Lord's doing, it's only the bad stuff that I'm doing. You know, so I, I think you've been hearing about what the Lord is doing. Because it's not our programs, it's not our clever ideas, it's not our slick staying up with everything. It's whether or not God, the son, the coach, the team owner, is freely walking around the team at work. That's the local church. It's not my church and my leaders, and I'm going to get four more on the board so I can get this through. I don't even vote on the elder board. If I have to vote, if I have to cast a deciding vote, it's certainly not from the Lord. I mean, this is not, God is not a democracy. God is one who works and moves in our hearts. And you know what it says in, I'm not even on this, but in James 3, you know what it says? It says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, easily entreated. When God is at work, there is a unanimity, there is an agreement, there is a awesome awareness that the Lord is at work. That's the things that are. Then the last thing it says in verse 19, write down what you've seen, that's chapter 1, write down the things that are, that's Jesus' tour of the local churches and the problems he saw. And then finally, write, thirdly, the things which will be after those things. So the way Revelation is written is, chapter 1 is the vision of Christ. Chapter 2 and 3 is Christ visiting his churches and warning about everything they're going to face throughout all the time until he comes and takes his church out of the world. But starting in chapter 4 to the end, the things which shall be after those things is the description of the end of days as seen from both heaven and earth. 
Now, it's interesting, the 102nd Psalm describes the earth as Dor and Haron, the, the end of days. I, I like the way God talks about the final times. He talks about it as the end of days. And that's described in verses, or chapters 4 to 22. And amazingly, Jesus reveals in the final chapters of Revelation that he has another team that he wants to use. You know, the church isn't the only team. God has two teams. He has the first team that was supposed to be his missionary force to the whole world. Did you know what it says in Isaiah that the, the temple was supposed to be? Jesus quotes it when he, when he cleansed the temple. He says, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations, not just for good Jews that could follow all the rules. They weren't supposed to put up all kinds of barriers to worldly people coming in and seeing God. They had so many rules in Jerusalem, you couldn't get near the temple. You had to take a little bath and change all your money and do all this stuff, none of which was in the Bible. They added so many traditions, they made so many barriers to keep the Gentiles far from God. And, and they became corrupt. They became external only Jewish followers of Christ. It wasn't in their heart. Jesus said, oh, that you would rend your hearts instead of your garments. He said, it's so external. And because his chosen people of promise, the Jews, would not be a house of prayer for all nations, the Lord shut them down. He said, I'm done with you for a while. And I'm going to let you wander and be chased here and there. And you're going to, you've read it all, right? You've read those last chapters of Leviticus. I mean, all the curses on them. But he says, but I'm going to restore again the the." the people of God, the chosen people of promise, the Jews. I'm going to restore them again after, Acts 15 says, after the Lord finishes his plan for the church. That's why we should all be Philadelphian Christians. We don't know which one of us is going to lead the person to the Lord that clicks that clicker in heaven that goes, that's the last one, go get them, you know? It's almost like uh, the Lord is waiting for the last one that is in his perfect plan for his church to lead to Jesus Christ, and he says, go get them. But then his second team, that's us. The first team is set aside. Second team is right now for 2,000 years so far. But that second team is going to be taken out and the Lord's going to resume the first team. And they're going to be the, the missionaries to the world. Literally. 144,000 literal Jewish evangelists. Two Jewish witnesses. And then a celestial angel. You know, you know what it says about the gospel. The final chapters of Revelation tell about that another team coming. The church is a second team. Jesus reverts back to his first team called Israel. They did not obey him. They were set over to the side for 2,000 plus years, but he's now ready to use them again. And they become the visible sign to the world. That's the whole book of Revelation. You want to understand Revelation? There's, there is Jesus Christ, there's team two, and then he reverts to team one. That's the whole book of Revelation. That's what he wants us to know. Let's apply this. We have five minutes to apply it. By the way, I'll share a little uh, uh, challenge I have. Uh, and, and applying Revelation's message to our life today, and I'm going to do this before we go, but I've been having the time of my life. Um, you know, I'm a church history professor, seminary professor, and a pastor, and, and I love to teach, and I, I have fun teaching and, and everything. But you know what I've increasingly learned is happening in America? People are really good at reading the Bible. We've got that down. You know, we have all these one-year Bibles and study Bibles and everything. We're really good at reading the Bible, but we're Americans. And basically, we like progress. That's the American way is progress. You know, we've got to progress. And so you know what we do? We have our little plan, whether it's read the Bible through once a year or haphazard or read it through once or whatever, and we have it mapped out and we do it. And basically what we do is most people, the majority of people, if you put it on a graph, the majority of people just read the Bible. Some people read the Bible and they note lessons or truths or principles or whatever from the Bible. I would say about 80% just read the Bible. About 15% more of the 100% 
read the Bible and find something, you know, like they write down their quiet time diary a few truths about that. Do you know what almost no believers do? You know how I know this? Because they're on the spot if you ask them. They don't apply what they read this morning to them, to their life. Now, we're really good at applying it to, boy, Bill and Mary should read that verse. Boy, they need to read that, or my kids, or my wife, or my husband. But do we apply it to us? Did you know every time we read the Bible, we are not done with our devotional time until we read a portion distill out of that portion a truth but we're not done yet until we remember what Jesus said don't merely be hearers of the word but what and we're really good at knowing that principle do you know what's the hardest thing you want to know what would really put people on the spot this morning do you know what the local church in the first century was all about they'd go up to people and say what is the Lord doing in your life today and the people would not talk about in 1960, whatever, 1980, when the Lord back in the... They'd say, this morning, as I was reading... In fact, you know, this morning I was over, you know, by the pool, sitting at this little metal table. All the lights are out in there. There's something wrong with the pool pump. It was boom, 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 making such a... Anybody hear that? I mean, it was, it was wonderful. It drowned out every other sound, you know. And I was sitting there just, just with my Bible open, and I, and I got everything set up, got my little cup of coffee, my pen, and my notebook. And, and after I just bowed for a word of prayer, all of a sudden, I heard, through all that bump, bump, bump sound, I heard the Lord talking to me. Did you know that the Bible is the word of God? And when you read it, the Lord speaks to us. Did you know I never want to start a day without listening to the voice of God? And it was so wonderful. I just started writing. And I got so much, but I knew my time was coming to a close. And I had to come to that point of applying it. You know what I was reading? I, I'm actually outlining the book of John. And I, I outlined uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7, and 8. But I backed up for the application to 7. And you remember what Jesus said in chapter 7? He said, on the last day, that great day of the feast, when they were pouring the water out from the big tall tower in the temple courtyard, and there were probably 200,000 people standing there, and all the mothers had their children be quiet because they all wanted to hear the sound of the water. The high priest would carry the silver pitcher that had been filled in the pool of Siloam, brought up to the temple mount. He climbed the platform with the pitcher, and he poured it out to reenact the water from the rock in Exodus. That's what happened at the last day of the great day of the feast. And so every person in the courtyard of the temple wanted to hear the sound of the water hitting the temple pavement. And so everyone did a collective, you know, like you don't want to move, you don't want to make a sound, and mothers would put their hands over their kids' mouths, you know, because they all wanted to hear. And can you imagine 200,000 people straining for about 15 seconds as that water was tipped and a big blob of it was falling at 16 T squared, you know, the velocity of stuff dropping. And they all were waiting. And at that exact moment, they didn't hear the water. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. I'll give him the water of life freely. Boy, they got mad. He was so out of place. Wasn't he a great communicator? Wait till you have 200,000 people, 400,000 ears, completely listening, and then say, if you let me, I will be inside of you like a river of living water. And you know I, what I apply? I said, Lord, today, I would like to not just know this truth. I would like to allow you to just be a river of living water in my life so I am not concerned with satisfying myself, but that I find you the ultimate satisfaction, that I don't resist weakening and old age, that I say, when I'm weak, then you're what? Yeah. And when I'm needy, you satisfy. Okay, so how do we apply Revelation's message to our lives today? 
What's the message of Revelation? What was God's purpose? The key lies in this response. God wants us to say, how do I best use my days if I am living in Christ's church at the end of days? How should I live? That's what the whole book of Revelation is about. It's not about making a chart and arguing over your chart. You know, that's how, how, how minimizing of God's word we get when we argue over, did you know there is no chart included? When I turned in my dissertation at Dallas, I did it on Revelation, and I remember I had to meet with the August board, you know, all the Bible faculty for doctoral, they all interview you personally. I admire all those men, love them, and it's kind of scary. In fact, I always dread who I'm going to be opposite. You know, I remember one year I was opposite here at Word of Life with Charles Ryrie. Did you know he doesn't even open a Bible when he speaks? He has it memorized. He puts the Bible up like this. Do you ever come when he sets it there? He quotes the verse, then he quotes the Greek words, then he parses them all, and then he gives all the background and has no notes. And, and so I had to sit for that group with my dissertation, and one of them said, um, where's your chart? I said, well, Revelation isn't about charts. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's actually the greatest Christology in all the Bible. And they smiled and they said, good. You have seen the message of that book. It's not a chart. Charts are very good and helpful. We need them. What's the application? Number one, Revelation 1. See, we need to see Jesus gathering with his local church. And what Jesus gathers with us to do is he wants to look at whether we're being and doing what he designed us to be. We are not spectators. When you come to church, it's not to see what you get. It's he, Jesus, is looking to see what you give. Whether you give true worship. You know what I say to Calvary Bible Church people? I say, you know what? I can't give worship to Christ if on Saturday night I'm, I'm blowing my health by staying up late and being at all kinds of places or going to some kind of media or entertainment that will deaden my mind. Did you know God reckons time this way? Whenever God tells time, have you ever thought how he tells time? He says it seven times. And the evening and the what? We're the first day. God thinks of time. It doesn't matter what your daytimer says or your watch or Greenwich Mean Time. When God thinks about a day, the day actually starts at sundown the day before. That's the beginning in God's mind. Not midnight. Sundown. The evening is the preparation for the next day. So what I tell people is, and by the way, I'm not a Sabbatarian or a Seventh-day Baptist or anything else, but in God's reckoning, the best Lord's Day starts by winding down every possible distraction to God on Saturday night and then allowing us to grow being in the spirit so that when we all, can you imagine if every person in your local church started focusing more than any other time of the week on the Lord on Saturday night and weren't watching all those inane shows that empty our minds and cause us to be amused. You know what amusement means? Don't meditate. Don't think deeply. And, and if instead we started meditating on whether we were doing and being what the one we're going to see on Sunday morning walking around our church, whether we were doing and being what he left us to do, and more importantly, to be. All of a sudden, we would not be critiquing, you know, the singer and how many mistakes the pastor made in his sermons. You know, I have people, I had someone just run up to me a couple weeks ago, and they went, <laughs> you know, and, and I knew they, they, they said, you made a mistake. I said, only one? <laughs> a mistake? I said, I, I make constant mistakes. Which one did you detect? That's the nice thing about being edited. I, everything I say gets edited before it goes online. They clean out all the mistakes. It's really wonderful. You know, if you listen to online people, they've been cleaned out, edited. They said, you said Aphrodite was uh, involved with uh, the goddess of love, and the goddess of love is not Aphrodite, it's Venus. 
I thought, boy, you're an expert on Greek mythology. I appreciate that. But I said, no, actually, what I said is Aphrodite was, was associated with fertility and sexuality, not love, sensuality, immoral practices, orgies. That's what I said. But I said, I appreciate that. And they looked at me. And they went, oh, I still think it's Venus. And I thought, you, you are not coming to detect what you're supposed to do and be. You come as a critic. And you know, a lot of people come to church that way. They're just waiting to find something. Jesus says, no, I want you to be looking at Christ's church and focus on Christ. And that's his highest priority. Did you know where Jesus is on Sunday? He's not on the golf course. He's not boating. He's not out there recreating. He gathers with his church. That's his priority. Christ's priority, his highest priority, is the local church. That's what chapter 1 is about. Chapter 2 and 3, Christ's warnings about the challenges facing the local church. The, this whole portion we're going to look at this week is when Jesus toured his local churches, he named seven of them. He named seven local geographic gatherings. And what he says is, these are real people and they have real problems. And the problems they have, all churches are going to face throughout all centuries. And you know what? Jesus was displeased with five of the seven. And that's the message he wants us to know. Because in, every, in, in Calvary Bible Church, there are all seven types of believers that are described in Revelation 2 and 3, and they're in your church too. And five of them, Jesus was very displeased with. In fact, with one of them, he says, repent or else. Very harsh. Another one, he said, these things you're doing, I hate. Wow. Finally, Revelation 4 to 22 the last part of Christ's message is God's word tells us exactly what the end of days is going to look like. My challenge to you is this. Realize Jesus Christ is walking around as the owner and coach of his church. He's looking at us every day to say, have you tuned in and heard my voice yet today? Have you heard it long enough to you know what I'm saying? And have you said, I'm going to apply that to my life and I'm going to do and be what you want me why you left me here? Why I'm on your team? You didn't call me to be a spectator. I'm supposed to be involved. And I'm going to stand before your judgment seat someday. And what you're going to judge me on is not how great my church was, how great my family was, how great my whatever accomplishments. It's whether I was in life and did in life what you wanted me to do. Whether I was a good and faithful what? Servant of Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of being at a place where your word is still honored, where the preaching of your word is still central to the programming of this place, and where people gather that love you. And I pray that we would love you so much that we would know your word and do it. And I pray as we unpack your message to these seven churches and look at it this week, that we will see how you want us to change, not someone else to change, us to change into your likeness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen.